Sir Martin. I can go on talking to you, and it's so fascinating to hear your insights. And you're not just a philosopher or a professor. You're actually using all that you are saying to build what you built in S4 Capital. Business point of view, you know, working from home and around was first nature. It wasn't even second nature to our people. The average age of our people on the media side, the 600 people, the mighty hivers, as we call them, around mighty hive with data and analytics and programmatic, uh, the average age is 25. The average age of the 2,000 monks, of which I'm the senior monk, uh, is about 32. And it was first nature, not even second nature. These are not these are digital natives. They come from the platforms and Google and Yahoo uh, and, and Salesforce. They don't come from the agencies. Some of them do, but many of them don't. They come from the tech companies, the platforms, the software companies, the hardware companies. So it was, it was second nature. Uh, our profitability, I was looking at it in May, our margins have actually increased as we've dropped real estate which is around 6 or 7% uh, of our revenues, uh, and we've consolidated our properties. Uh, and our top line, you know, we went in... 7% of cost, not revenue. No, cost. And our top line, uh, we went in, you know, we've committed to doubling the size of the company every three years, which that's organically, that's ex excluding deals which means if you're mathematically minded a 24% compound growth rate. So we went in with a budget for this year of gross profit, that's top line, net revenue, increase of 30%. And in the first five months, despite COVID, despite COVID, we're up about 14 or 15% on a pro forma basis. So we've done very well, you know, with the ad holding groups, down forecast to be down at least sort of 10 to 15, 15 to 20 percent. So we've done extremely well. And the delta between our business, which is purely digital, we're only interested in digital and we're building a, a purely digital business, the delta remains about 40, 40 percent between what the holding companies do are doing and ours. And very interestingly, and finally, from a business point of view, the market, the stock market, looks at us as being a proxy, and this is a grand statement, but if you look at the Credit Suisse circular that was issued yesterday, if you look at the circular that was issued by Jeffries a few weeks ago, we, we are, our comparators are not the ad holding companies, you know, WPP, and I say this with some sadness, to be you know, very direct about it, I am the largest personal shareholder still in WPP, and the stock is down by 50% in two years, whereas S4 currently is up about 165%. So the Delta, and we, we compare, we are compared to the tech companies, to Google and Facebook, and I know it's a grand example, and it's a bit like comparing a, a peanut to an elephant, but having said that, we're regarded as being tech-based, and, and more than 50% of our revenues come from the tech companies. And so from a business point of view, Anurag, it's been challenging, but really interesting. Intellectually, if I can put it that way, very interesting. From a personal point of view, I feel better mentally, I have to tell you. I feel better physically. I don't have to rush around on planes. I've had more time to think more time to take measure and technology as we're seeing now with you and the colleagues that we'll talk to in a few minutes, the, it's a much more measured world in many respects. I mean, I'm fortunate, as I said at the first point, it's the privilege that have done better than the underprivileged, which is the sadness about, about COVID. But I have the resources, physical resources at home to have a, a some reasonable comfort. I'm not, you know, crammed into one room with other members of my family, as many are. And so, I, I have to say, it hasn't been, it hasn't been bad, and it's taught us a lot of very important lessons, which we can come on to. Thank you, sir, Martin. You are a great example of turning every opportunity into a grand success, uh, and in some way, 
you show. I them. wish. I wish. Anna, no, you I have. Wish. What what S four has achieved in a very short span, and uh, with what COVID has provided us an opportunity for digital acceleration and your positioning as a digital uh, communications, uh, you know, ecosystem. If I may use that word, ha- mm-hmm. augur as well. Now tell us uh, how is the marketing services landscape changed in the last four months? Uh, some of it was in the works for many years, but the last few months and weeks accelerated. So tell us how well, the give us a granularity on why is say a certain holding company's shares down, uh, and why are you know analysts looking at S four and similar? There's no similar uh, model, but purely digital uh, model that's more promising. So give us what's happening in the marketing services uh, landscape. Well, well, I think you know. You know, I think all of these things come down to strategic positioning and execution. At the end, I mean, you know, there was that big debate at business schools many years ago, or not so many years ago, about whether strategy was more important than execution. And then there were some professors that said it's all about execution. Don't worry about the strategy. I think the honest answer is, it's both. And we're very fortunate, you know, in a way, you know, out of adversity, in a way, comes comes opportunity that the Chinese characteristic for crisis is also opportunity, which everybody, everybody says. And, you know, two years ago, what I did was look at that WPP portfolio that had taken 33 years to build and is now, I think, being destroyed and dismembered. I'm putting it very, very, in a very tough way, but I think really the, the pressure inside WPP and Publicis and Denso in particular is huge. And I looked at that portfolio two years ago and there were three big growth areas. And I I think the reason it's changed, Anna, is if you went back to my experience at Sarches, you know, I've sort of had three lives, Sarches, WPP, and now S4. Sarches and WPP was about Globalization, Theodore Levitt, Harvard Business School, 1983, October 1983, I think it was about people in the world consuming everything in the same way everywhere, over egg to make the point, but it was the point. And then the beginnings of technology. So Sarches was about globalization, WPP was about globalization, and the beginnings of technology. And, and, and they were value-based models. They were about value. They were about market share and rather like P&G and Unilever detergents. You know, you, some of your, your detergent products might cannibalize another brand, one brand cannibalizing the other. But at the end of the day, you built market share. It was a very different concept. What S4 is about and, and the change, and you see it in the stock markets. You see it yesterday uh, with the Dow Jones and NASDAQ, you know, hitting a, a high five, year, five times in a row. Google going through a trillion dollar market cap again yesterday along with Apple and Microsoft uh, and and Amazon. And what it's about is growth. So I looked at the portfolio and I said, where's the growth? You know, WPP's portfolio, even at that time, was flat to up a little bit. Where's the growth? First party data, digital advertising content, and programmatic and data analytics. So I went about trying to put together a group and we've done, what, 13 mergers. We call them mergers because everybody, all the key people, and we have a great team at S4. We have the strongest team that I've seen, including people at Sarches and at WPP, as strong as, strong as the very best in those, those companies and starting to execute extremely effectively, put together four principles. And this is where I think marketing services has changed. Firstly, we're totally focused on digital because that's where the growth is. Even this year in COVID, in the teeth of COVID, digital spending will be flat. It will not be down. Even Group M and uh, IPG's Magna Group talk about digital being flat, maybe down a smidgen, but traditional media down 15 or 20% or 10 or 15, digital flat, the total media market down probably around 10, 12%, something like that. And digital 
250 billion out of 550, 600 last year will be 250 this year out of around 500 billion. So digital is where the growth is. Prior to COVID growing at 20%, I think next year, 2021, will be back at 20% growth with a market share going of media going to two thirds by 2024. We forecast 57.5% by 2022. So that's number one. Number two, the model has shifted. I, I, I would call it the Netflix model. Net, the Netflix model is still the best model that I have seen. It uses first party data and with the mixing of, the, of third party cookies by Google and by Apple, a Google over the next two years, the importance of first party data and control of first party data by all our clients is absolutely critical. So it's first party data driving the creation of digital advertising content not necessarily, I mean, there's still a role for TV and there's still a role for brand films. Big ideas at the core of it, both traditional and digital, but it's an iterative process. It's like an election model, like an election without an election date, because you have everything coming at you 24-7. You're sending out messages, your competitors are sending back messages, and you have to have greater control. So control of the advertising content and you distribute it algorithmically and programmatically. That's an iterative model like a loop. So that's the second thing, what we call the Holy Trinity model of data driving content and programmatic. Second. Third, faster, better, cheaper. Agility is the key corporate attribute. All traditional companies, all CEOs, all CMOs, all CFOs, all CIOs, all CTOs complain in an analog company that they don't move fast enough. And COVID-19 has made them jump. And they are jumping. And we'll talk about that, I know, with the panel, because I think it's something that everybody is seeing. So agility is key. Better means understanding the following companies. Let me list them, because I think they're re it's really important. Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, TikTok, the subsidiary, of ByteDance, where Kevin Mayer has gone, Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, Salesforce, Oracle, IBM, SAP, Twitter, Pinterest, Snap, Netflix, Spotify. You could add Samsung, LG. Those companies, you have to know both as client and agency inside out. And what you do is you distribute, you refer to use the word ecosystem, Anurag, that's the ecosystem in which we're operating. And cheaper means efficiency, not ZBB, because zero-based budgeting, I think, ignored the importance of innovation and branding. What it did was cut out so much cost that it forgot about the importance of innovation and branding. So it's efficiency, but it's in a, in a different way. And then the fourth point is, and this is key to why the ad holding companies are failing, the key is a unitary structure. I referred to the transactions that we've done, the, the inorganic growth, because we started from zero, I referred to them as mergers. They are mergers. What we say to the people who join us is not, do you want to sell your business? That is anathema to us. That, we say, if you want to sell your business, go and talk to Accenture or go and talk to Dentsu or WPP. But if you want to join us on a mission, and you know, if it, I am the senior monk, so I guess I'm missionary about it. If you want to join us on a mission to create a new age, new era, advertising and marketing services model, which is what we're doing. And secondarily, if you want to disrupt the status quo, Join us on that. We're not, we're not going to pay the highest price. We're not going to do five-year earnouts as we did at WPB. That creates too fragmented a structure. What we're doing is creating a unified structure. Clients want the best people working on the business. Long answer to your question, but it's a fundamental one. These are the changes that COVID-19 have accelerated. They haven't moved the needle, I think, significantly in, in the direction 
it's ex just accelerated the change. So everything we saw before COVID, which was moving at a certain speed, that speed has doubled, tripled, quadrupled, quintupled, whatever you want to put it. Uh, and now the premium is on the speed of action. You don't have the luxury anymore of waiting. You know, before, before COVID-19, you know, if you were running, and this is an important point, if you were running what I call an uncontrolled company, that is a company where there is a separation between ownership and control. I mean, look at the board of WPP. None of the directors, none of them, whether either executive or non-executive, have a significant financial interest in the company. So there is a separation between ownership and control. You have to unify it. That's my view. But where you have a separation of ownership and control, CEO on average would last for five years. McKinsey would say the average company in the S&P 500, the FTSE 100 lasts for 17 years. So you, you looked at your five years as a CEO and yeah, before COVID, GDP was up two or three or four percent. You grew at GDP or maybe a bit faster. You cut your costs a bit. You bought back stock. Your EPS went up by five to 10 percent. You, maybe you, you pegged your dividend to your EPS growth. It was a comfortable life and a decent legacy. Now, COVID-19 has meant all bets are off. You have to get cracking and change. So we are seeing insight, and I think this is the key thing about COVID. We are seeing inside companies a, a growing propensity or urgency to change. So, so digital disruption, digital transformation is the key thing and getting on with it as quickly as possible has become the premium. It has become the thing that you have to do. Thank you. I want to go to a very basic tenet of advertising. Today, all of us in this ecosystem, in the business of creating brands, in the business of creating demand, do you think advertising can bring demand? Because the problem with COVID is that demand, I'm talking of India, has gone down. People are holding up. So do you see advertising bringing up demand? And let's say using digital because people are engaging more with all the digital platforms. Well, you know, there is this... Um... And I, and I think it's a, a thing, again, it, many people in the advertising industry look back to the past with rose-tinted spectacles. And I think this is a, this is a weakness. Life has changed. The, the definition of creativity has broadened. It is no longer Mad Men and Don Draper. It is no longer dominated by 30-second or 60-second TV commercials. And digital builds brands. To say, to say that traditional is the only way of building brands is, in my view, a nonsense. It's a very narrow way of looking at the industry and has to change. The, the, it's not the total prerogative. Creativity is not totally confined to a creative director who sits in the corner office with the bonus and the Ferrari. Uh, and it and is is worshipped inside the agency. There are creative media planners and buyers. There are creative da data analysts. There are created uh, software engineers. The, create the definition of creativity has changed. Need I say violently from what it was? And in terms of this recession, this is very different to anything else I've seen. Uh, it's not like the great financial crisis. It's not like the internet bust of 2001-2. It's not like the crisis of 91-2, which many people on this call probably don't even remember, or going back to the oil price crisis of the 1970s. This is as near as you can get to wartime. And I think, coming back to your question, it is, it is wrong of our industry to suggest that in the teeth of COVID-19, the solution is to spend, spend, spend. Some of the, some of the people here uh, in the industry here in London and in New York said the solution 
in the in the depths of it as far as the the west were concerned although in america we are seeing a resurgence uh, of cases but in the depths of it in march and april said the solution was spend 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 i i totally disagree with that that was not the solution at that point in time the the solution it was an existential crisis companies were in were threatened with being wiped out and and the unique thing about this is look at central bank fiscal intervention. I can't get, Anurag, I talk to investment institutions. I can't get an investment institution, even the most powerful in the world, when we talk to them, to give me a figure as to what the total fiscal infusion into the world's economy is. The world is about $75 trillion uh, of GDP. The US is about 23, 24. China's around 12, 13, 14. Japan, I think, is about five or six. The, the, the five big Western European countries are all around two and a half, three and a half trillion. We, one big institution said to me, this is the range, the range they put on it. They thought the figure was something like 15 to 30 trillion, right? Let's assume it's at the south end of that for a minute, around 15. I heard Vestager, um, not uh, Vestager, uh, sorry, Van, Van der Leyen, uh, of the EU say that the EU fiscal stimulus was around 13 trillion euros. So, which I think is on the high side, but let's say it's around 15. That's huge in the context of, of what's gone before. That is what is necessary to maintain and increase the economy. You've seen the Chinese in the last few days pumping a lot of liquidity into the system. The puzzle a few weeks ago was why the Chinese central bank, People's Bank of China, the PBOC, had not done it. Now they're starting to do it. I think it's because of the trade tensions. I think it's because of Hong Kong and Taiwan and the Philippines and Australia. And indeed, dare I say it, the tensions with India uh, and the US, which worry me greatly. I mean, it's top of my concerns or amongst the top of my concerns, the conflagration between the US and China, which, I, you know, this bifurcation, this decoupling is a serious issue. But now, coming back to your question, is the time when our clients have to get their act together. It was not the time to do it in March and April. In March and April and May, it was a time to conserve. My view is, you know, no, I, I've, you know, I write to all our people every Sunday I've been doing it now for 15 weeks through COVID. And, you know, I've said about probably the third or fourth week that I wanted to prepare S4 to emerge from the COVID-19 crisis at the end of June and going into July. I wanted to do, I wanted to conserve our financial resources. I wanted to maintain a strong balance sheet, which we managed to do, net cash, no debt. And as we, we've done a couple of deals, we, we bought a data and analytics, merged with a data and analytics business in Argentina. Two or three weeks ago, we merged with a similar business, data and analytics in Australia. Last week, we will be doing something uh, in the third week in July around the Amazon platform in North America. So we, are, we have been active, but at a small scale because I want to maintain the strength of the balance sheet. Now is the time to take advantage at precisely the time that the holding companies are laying off 50,000 people. That's what they're doing worldwide. And in America, the holding companies and the independent agencies are laying off 50,000 people. So there's a huge cull, a Darwinian cull taking place in those companies. And what are we doing? We're hiring more people. We're cutting our indirect costs. We're cutting our real estate costs. And we're investing more people. We've gone from 2,400 people, small scale, to 2,600 people over COVID. So we're continuing to invest. We're continuing to hire at precisely the time now. So the answer to your question is, just like we're investing in our seed corn, which is our talent, I think clients now have to start to open their wallets. This is the time to take about, as, because Q2 is a disaster. And we're going to see the results 
of the companies reporting in the next few weeks, and it will be a bloodbath. But Q3 will be relatively better. Q4 will be relatively better. And as we get into 2021, I think we're going to be surprised by the upside. And, and to put it, to give a shape to it, the Nike swoosh is not the right analogy. I don't think it's, it, it's a, there are some sectors that are V-shaped and we can discuss that. There are some sec sectors that are U-shaped, that are L-shaped. I don't think there are any chairs that are going out completely out of business. There are some that are really challenged, like the airline industry, but that I, I don't think there are many chairs, if any. But I think overall, it's a, to confuse everybody, it's a reverse square root. So think about that reverse square root, a sharp downward contraction, a sharp upward correction, but not to the level that we were before. It's going to take some time, a year or two, to get. That's why I think the swoosh is not the right analogy, because the swoosh implies you're going to go past it. It's going to take time. But there will be sectors that do. You know, for example, the tech sector, those companies that I mentioned, those 20 or so companies, you know, they are V-shaped. The U-shaped tends to be more the packaged goods companies, although Procter had an outstanding, Procter & Gamble had an outstanding first quarter. Unilever had a good first quarter, but it has its food service businesses and ice cream businesses that have been under pressure. But General has done well with its product portfolio. Nestle has done well. L'Oreal has done well. But when you look at all of them, Mondelez has done well, very well. But when you look at them, it's their online that has really taken off like a rocket. I was listening to Levi Strauss yesterday. Chip Berg, the CEO, is cutting uh, the number of people in the business, I think by 15,000 people. And he says to invest in innovation and marketing and grow the business. And I think, again, that's emblematic of what should be happening now. Not in the teeth of the crisis, but now. Now is the time to take advantage of this huge fiscal stimulus. That's why the markets are where they are. Some people say they're too high. Some people say they're, they're not because you take out healthcare and you take out tech. The markets really in America haven't gone anywhere. But that's been the case for about five, sure. six or seven years. So the fiscal stimulus has really protected. So, for example, here in the UK, what I'm worried about is what happens when the furloughs you know, the government has subsidized all businesses. If you retained your people, they yeah, would pay 80% 80, 80 until October. And Rishi Sunak, you know, our, our, our chancellor, it, oh. who's done tremendously well, came out with a nine billion pounds stimulus yesterday. I, right direction. You know, if we, we've taken no government money, you know, we're doing, uh, we, we applied but we were refused because, I, because we're doing too, too well. You know, in Holland, for example, you, were, you would be given government subsidy if your sales were down by 25%. Ours are up 15%, so we can't, you know, we can't, we can't argue that. But Sunak, the Chancellor, has put in $9 billion, And if we, if we had furloughed anybody, which we haven't, basically, if we kept them on, we would get a, a bounty, if you like, of a thousand pounds, I think it is, uh, as long as we pay, continue to pay them for, for two months. Look, I think it's a good idea what he's doing, but it's, it's not enough. And I turned on the television this morning, Squawkbox, CNBC Squawkbox, and what do I see? I think Airbus is cutting its headcount by a huge number. I mean, thousands of thousands of jobs. And I'm very worried about what's going to happen in the UK in terms of employment or lack of employment when the furloughs come off in October. Now, I, I still think, despite that concern, that now is the time to invest. You know, we've been through, I know this is difficult to say because I know in Mumbai and Delhi and some other parts of India, uh, life continues to be extremely difficult and COVID is still a big threat. Right. But I think generally now is the time that all that money, that government money has started to be saved by the consumer. And I think to your point, what we have to do is in a, be in a position 
to get these consumers into a more positive frame of mind. And to do that, we will have to spend and invest. I had, you know, I'd look forward to doing another conversation. We have uh, leaders of the marketing communication domain, leaders of corporates who had the marketing function or the business function waiting to do a conversation with you. And we Good. have a very special person in Ms. Dipati Nair, who is the CMO of IBM in India. Uh, she's worked uh, before in you know, many sectors, including travel services. She also worked in Marico. Uh, and she's very active. If she's not working, she's uh, teaching at business schools. She's writing. And she's using technology to make a difference. So I'll hand it over to Dipali in a sec. But I just want to, I want to ask you this question and I want a short answer because Dipali, Vivek, Sundar, uh, and everybody else uh, is waiting. How do you get so much energy at, you know, to reinvent yourself, to be so competitive. Uh, how do you, and I, you know, I'll write you a separate mail on that. Uh, two mails actually. But tell us, how does one reinvent oneself? You know, you've turned every adversity into an opportunity. So give us something that people can take away and benefit from. Um, well, one thing is my mother's genes. So that's, that's one, one thing. Number two, I didn't want to retire when I left WPP. And I, listen, look, to be blunt with you, to be very blunt, uh, I felt that the way, and that there's a third element to this, uh, the way that WPP or the chairman of WPP in particular, but the board as well, handled it, um, you know, because I decided to step down to, to resign. Uh, I felt the way they handled it was if I, if I was English understatement, poor. And, you know, the market value of WPP subsequently is now halved. Um, I'm not saying that the two events are necessarily totally related to one another, but I think they are related. Uh, and I, uh, I said in management today, uh, last week, that I think the circumstances were, the way I put it, was slightly unfair. So that is a motivating force as well, Anna. And there are lots of examples, you know, and I won't quote them because they're far too grand to quote, but there are a lot of similar examples where I think boards have made terrible mistakes. Uh, I'm not saying this is one of them, but it could be. And so that's the third element. There you go. Thank you, <laughs> Sir Martin. Look forward to having another conversation with you and I'll... I wish you luck with what you're doing with S4K. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you. And thank the you for the opportunity. Over, over to Dipali. And Dipali has a fantastic panel. And, you know, she has a, her charming ways to do it. So over to you, thank Dipali. You. Thank you, Anurag. And uh, Sir Martin, you're here as part of the panel. And you need no introduction. But I want to now use one term, which is young Sir Martin. Okay, so we have young Sir Martin <laughs> with us. And I'm going to introduce my other four panelists, uh, very stellar reputations in the Indian uh, marketing fraternity. Uh, first, Shalini Rao. She is the CMO now at Bangalore International Airport Limited. She's an expert in strategic marketing and brand building, customer experience, digital transformation. She's responsible for branding, communication, and marketing there. And prior to jo joining Bangalore International Airport Limited, she was a brand consultant for Tata Sons. She has headed global marketing at the Taj Group. Uh, we all know of Taj and marketing at Tetra Pak India and Mars India. So Shalini, thank you for joining us today. And after Shalini, I want to introduce Vaibhav. He is a very young, very, very smart marketer. <laughs> he is vice president and head e-commerce at digital and digital marketing at Max Life Insurance. Uh, he has expertise in new product development, incubating new business lines, redefining customer journeys, absolute expert in insurance. When I spoke to him, you know, for the prep, I was so thoroughly impressed. And he's been selected as a 30 CMO super honor roll by IMAI and 100 smartest digital marketing leaders by the World Marketing Congress. Uh, and Vivek, uh, Vivek in his lovely, vibrant blue t-shirt today. Vivek, who's also worked for Ogilvy before, he's an industry veteran with 30 years of experience. He joined Pity Light Industries as a CMO uh, in Jan 2015, looks across, looks over all businesses. He's responsible for market planning, implementation, and brand development. He's also worked before at Philips. Um, and then, of course, Sundar, uh, my friend, 
uh, Sundar Madakshara. Uh, he's the head of marketing at Adobe India. He leads all businesses and routes to the market planning there. He's responsible for building Adobe brand strategy and awareness in India. Partners very closely with the country leadership team to grow the Adobe business in India. He's had 24 years of experience in sales and marketing. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's also worked for Hindustan Unilever, Wipro, Visa, SAP and Infosys. But Sir Martin, you stand the youngest here. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, as is customary, we always tend to ask the first questions to the ladies, but I won't. You know, I'm going to ask the first question to Sundar. Uh, uh, Sundar, you've been the Adobe, you know, CMO for a while, and you have the vantage point of speaking to most top CMOs in the country, therefore. You know, I want you to share, and, you know, we, we spoke to Sir Martin about all the stuff that's happening across the world, but what I want you to do is to share with us, what are the CMOs telling you about what's happening in India, in the digital transformation domain, in this current context? Thank you, Deepali. It's... Uh... Wonderful to be a part of this panel. So welcome to all of you. And uh, um, it's an honor to be with all of you and with uh, Sir Martin Sorrell on the same panel. Um, I was, for a moment, I was just feeling that it would have been so great for me to just attend this event and listen to all of you. Um, but um, I think um, um, I read a thought you know, a long time back and it stuck to my mind saying that your attitude will determine your altitude. Uh, and uh, that is so true. Uh, you're right. Uh, I'm in, in my current role, I have the privilege of speaking to uh, marketing folks across many industries. And it's great to see how people from the same industry have, are reacting very dif differently uh, to the challenges that they face. So I thought um, what, you know, when I was trying to summarize what I should, you know, what broad buckets they fall into. They are, uh, I call it SHRED, S-H-R-E-D, right? And what each of that uh, potentially stands for. The first one, SHRED is S-H-R-E-D, the first one is S. So I think there are a bunch of people, and uh, uh, you know, we alluded to that point earlier, was about who people who are wanting to seize the moment and accelerate, right? The people who said, look, great that the old rules don't apply anymore. Let me look at my world in a different way. Let me seize this as an opportunity and then sort of move ahead. That's the first category. Uh, an example of that uh, is a holiday resort. Uh, it's headed by a friend of mine. And uh, I was trying to reach out to him when the lockdown and all of that happened. And he said that he was very busy. He always said he's very busy and he's not able to meet. So I think, look, you guys must be the laziest people in this world. Or nobody's going to be coming to your resort. So what are you busy working on? He said, look, that's precisely the time. We believe that, you know, we want to make a digital transformation happen uh, when, you know, in, in these uh, circumstances and we want to accelerate it. We want to achieve what we would have probably taken two years to do it in two months. So when this is all over, we are representing ourselves like a new company. So that's the first one, S, which is seizing and you know, accelerating the opportunity. The second one is about H, which is hearing and listening. I think people want to hear and listen to their customers that much more, right? This is a time when a lot of these segmentations, the traditional way we've approached the market, the positioning has had to change. So that's the second thing in terms of hearing and listening. The next one, the third one is on reimagining the world. I think many people are saying, look, my customer journeys, the way I have thought about their buying cycles, their imperatives has completely changed. So let me reimagine my business. My business is not going to be the same. The fourth one is on empathy. I think, you know, today you hear more people talk to you with more empathy. The first thing people ask you is, how are you? And how, is you, how are you doing? Are you safe? Are you, uh, how is your family doing? How do you? I think that comes from a genuine concern that we all have for each other. And that's coming out more. I'm glad that marketers are able to sense this and say, look, we need to talk to our and, you know, our customers with more empathy. But the last one is data. And this is the trickiest Deepali. You and I know that. You know, data is, uh, you know, the, the past data that we have might not be fully usable now because a lot of these things have changed. So you can keep on analyzing, but the data will not be useful to the entire day. But it has got very important uh, prognosis about how things are going to move up. So I'm seeing people, you know, listening to their customers on a more daily basis collecting data more frequently than they were and coming to conclusions saying, look, this is what I'm going to 
do for next 30 days. After that, I don't know. But I'll chart my way by looking at data, burying my decisions in, in facts rather than um, just making it out of wills. So shred model is five broad buckets into which one from my CMO sense. Yeah, wonderful, Sundar. And you know, I would like to add to that because at IBM we speak to CIOs all the time. Uh, and what I want to say is that there is an acceleration of transformation happening. You know, everybody is recognizing, and Sir Martin also referred to that. Uh, you know, and the other thing that is happening in top enterprises whom we service at IBM is that it's happening at scale. So it's not at just mm -hmm. at the startups. It's not just at the unicorns. It's happening at very very large uh, you know enterprises. And you know, to go on with uh, you know uh, who we have here and now uh, Shalini, I think one of the unique things that you're doing, Shalini, is despite the fact that airport has not been used, you know, in the last hundred days or so, uh, you know, you you do not have flyers coming into the airport. You are still, you know, continuing to communicate. And I want you to therefore share with everybody, you know, how are you making sense of this mayhem that is happening? What are you doing currently and why? Why is it that you think it's important for us to engage with the flyers even just now? Thanks, Sipali. Uh, so a couple of things and I think taking forward from what Sundar said as well, what we realized is when this whole crisis hit us, and I, I guess it hit us pretty hard because suddenly from, uh, you know, X number of flyers a day, 100,000 a day, we suddenly went to almost zero. And we realized that there were two things that were coming up at that time. And uh, very classic consumer behavior market insight. Uh, people were worried uh, about how and when they were going to travel again. And there was a desperate need for information. And we realized that just from the sheer deluge of questions that we were getting on our call center, on our website, personally, and we said this is a great time for us to continue to engage because suddenly all the old mediums got taken away. Nobody on ground, nobody in restaurant, nobody shopping, nobody doing anything. Uh, and we went out and said we have to engage because you're going to come back and travel again. But you're going to come back with a very different set of expectations and you're worried. So reassurance and information were two things we picked up and we said, okay, let's actually go out and reassure you and tell you everything that we're doing, one, while waiting for you to come back. And it's been about 30 days now since we've restarted domestic operations at least. Um, and just reassuring that it is a safe way to fly. There's a whole bunch of things that we're doing to keep you safe. So it's okay to come out. And the second is so much changing on information. Uh, so we actually created something called uh, Voice of BLR and we literally give out FAQs. We've tied up with the government. So we're just beaming out information saying, this is how we're engaging. And there's a third angle which came up actually by chance, which is really this whole thing of nostalgia. You've been in the travel business. I've been in the travel business even earlier. Uh, people are dying to travel. People are dying to get back. They're missing their holidays. Yes. So we tapped into that. So UGC became such a big thing. Yes. And so the digital space therefore took over completely uh, to be able to deliver that. And interestingly, a very small statistic, we've grown our followers uh, almost between 10 to 20% at a time when we were not flying. Uh, yes. And that was quite interesting for us to see. And of course, I told you the story about 6.4 million views on my contactless film because we were just giving out information. That's yes. it. So yeah, so that's what we're doing. I think I, I'm seeing a common thread of the pivot that almost every marketing uh, you know, organization has had to do and CMOs are leading that. And Vivek, with that, I want you to uh, you know, tell us that you don't communicate just with the end consumers, you know, the area of businesses that you have at Pidilite. You know, you're also going down and talking to carpenters, to contractors, to workers in the building industry, Vivek. You know, how are you engaging with them? You know, so Shalini told us about you know, the flyers, which are, let's say, you know, slightly upper socioeconomic you know space what are you guys doing and how are you digitally engaging with the strata you know which is not typically known to be uh, somebody that we engage with digitally what are you doing Vivek? So good afternoon everyone uh, it's my pleasure to be on this distinguished panel with Sir Martin and all my esteemed colleagues uh, for benefit of listeners so that you can understand what I'm going to refer to uh, Pidlite is a billion dollar uh, company in adhesives and construction chemicals with brands like Favicol, Dr. Fixit and MC. We are both in B2B and B2C space. Uh, the brand which I'm going to talk about, Dr. Fixit and Fevicol, are used in consumers' home for furniture making and waterproofing, but they're not bought by them. They're bought by contractors 
carpenters and waterproofers who use it in their homes at the outset before i answer your question i would like to make an observation uh, from what sundar was discussing i think we must distinguish that it enablement is different from digital transformation what we are seeing in in covid uh, just enabling your processes to be digitally enabled is just it enablement the real digital transformation is we do when we actually make a meaningful difference to brand deliveries to our customers by mapping their consumer journeys and making a meaningful difference there and let's talk about the consumer and the customer journeys we have of contractors and waterproofers and carpenters now these are the people who are not very educated but everyone has a smartphone and our processes of connect with our contractors were already digitally enabled what has this pandemic done is that it has accelerated the whole transformation and the connect program you know if i can say dipali the first question which you asked from the, from the on the uh, package goods company and services company which we are this covid has actually converted naysayers into believers in the company yes. that's one second is it has actually accelerated the digital transformation at a very rapid pace what was happening earlier in our company in one year we now plan to do in 60 to 90 days and we have formed crack teams of young people to do it now quickly answer your question what did we do in this time with the contractors and waterproofers and con- uh, and, and carpenters very simply we converted all our meetings with them from offline to online mm. we did for our training with them digitally on phones through films and meetings we did the new product launches we did safety training for covid we also knew that they were struggling in their business to enter into consumer homes because consumers are very very safety conscious yeah. so we trained all our contractors carpenters on safety covid safety program we certified them we gave them the safety kits and we actually enabled their business and we are continue to be training all these thousands of contractors or carpenters third interesting thing we observed was that consumer attitude the behaviors and consumption is changing in these times consumer is becoming more value conscious our consumer is repairing more at home they are spending more time at home and in india which is not a diy country they are doing more diy themselves because handyman is not available yeah so ob- observing that we use digital uh, marketing means to reach to these consumers we we have promoted our art and craft to parents and children and hobby teachers aggressively in these times with uh, with art and craft videos art and craft kits available through e-commerce platforms and content and we have promoted diy videos so in summary if i can say the digital acceleration has really helped us to reach out to our carpenters contractors waterproofer masons to engage with them to connect with them to educate them and to support them in their business i think supporting these underprivileged uh, working class uh, is a real uh, opportunity we saw in these times wonderful Well, Vivek, and thank you for outlining that message as to you know what digital transformation is. Uh, you know, at IBM, we like to communicate that to our audiences. We like to tell you know all CXOs and CIOs that you know it is about you know the pervasiveness of data, usage of data in terms of how you make decisions, how you empower your ecosystem and your employees to be able to take decisions on the basis of data, how you embed AI everywhere, and of course you know do it uh, you know on the with security and with the privacy concerns in mind. You know with that i want to uh, uh, you know move on to webhub and webhub i have been a you know cmo at an insurance organization also you and i have that in common and you know from that experience i know that the partnership you know uh, that you have with your cio with the it team uh, you know when it comes to e-commerce is key to winning in the market more than any other industry you know i can say that about insurance and financial services right however you and i also know that while everybody is talking about transformation you know it's not always possible and it's not always so quick on account of the you know legacy systems that we have you know while we would like to do everything at super speed but it's not possible what is your experience been at max life and you know what steps are you taking therefore to uh, you know prepare yourself for the future thank you thank you dipali good afternoon to all the panelists good afternoon sir martin sorel it was quite a pleasure to hear some of the themes that you picked up i i personally picked up couple of interesting action was that i i take back from that 30 minute interaction so so deepali honestly uh, i i represent the bfsi category here right uh, traditional category uh, especially in a country like india has always been extremely reliant on people meeting people people coming to offices in branches uh, finding their bosses who drive them for sales then going out meeting new people and then trying to you know pick up checks as we used to say right convert convert customer prospects into customers right 
extremely traditional business, a very old category of life insurance, 170 year old uh, business, actually a category, right? Now, uh, interestingly, uh, Diwali, uh, transformation was not a need to have for us. It was almost a survival for us, right? And I completely agree with Vivek that it was not about automation or digitization of processes, but almost a transformation in terms of the way we uh, envisage our consumer onboarding journey, our distributor onboarding journey, and the way our distributors interact with customers. And I'll, I'll spend some time on it. So uh, really, and if I, if I honestly speaking, you know, a few years back, we had done this uh, integrated customer journey. And that time it was nice to have. Huh? That was that time it was a nice to have marketing item to have uh, to do an integrated consumer journey and arrive at, you know, some consumer personas. And we arrived at three very distinct consumer personas when it comes to a category like life insurance. You know, uh, a safety seeker, a support seeker consumer, which is <coughs> consumer in this country, then a well-informed consumer and then an independent consumer. And, you know, and we just plot these three personas, unique personas on need for human touch and let's say a Y axis of uh, awareness towards the category. And, you know, typically an independent persona uh, would come where he has very low need for human touch and reasonably decent awareness of the category. And you know, uh, we, and, and then that is, it is at that stage that, you know, we as a life insurance company took a call that we should, you know, uh, invest heavily in a B2C business, starting with digital advertising, onboarding and digital acquisition. Once again, uh, a very nice to have element, right? Uh, good to show in a board meeting, important from valuation perspective, but guess what? Uh, as things panned out in the last quarter, uh, looks like, you know, uh, the whole COVID situation and the fear of, you know, being sick, the fear of dying actually, I mean, for lack of a word, has what has caused an unprecedented growth in the number of people searching for life insurance on Google. I yeah. mean, yeah, right now, the for the first quarter of FI 21, interestingly, uh, there's a 84% search growth. Search group. Search volume has gone up. Of, yeah, yeah. Term insurance or life insurance, right? right? My brothers in Hong Kong and Singapore and Malaysia are actually because that's what happened there, right? COVID has hit everyone. But yeah. our friends in Hong Kong are experiencing flat search on life insurance. Our friends in Singapore are, inform, are experiencing about a 5% growth. Our right. friends in Malaysia are experiencing a 6% growth. So clearly, you know, we are a different country. We are a unique country. We respond to a different situation, different stimulus in a very different manner. And guess what? We suddenly are bombarded with demand. I mean, crazy demand. I mean, I have, I, we haven't experienced that kind of demand, honestly. I mean, we were not, uh, I mean, for a, I'll be honest and candid here. We were not actually ready for this kind of a demand, frankly. And, you know, it's taken the mickey out of us for the last hundred days to make sure that we are able to, you know, create the right kind of this kind of demand. Yeah. And, and uh, hopefully, you know, as the next, and I know this sounds very different from what we've been hearing in terms of how different industries have, you know, fared. But I'm pretty confident that, you know, as we move into the next quarter and a couple of quarters further, it will start showing in the results and some of the earning per share kind of, uh, you know, price point that you'll see for the category of insurance in general or life insurance specifically. So, so honestly, uh, it's been a very interesting last hundred days for us. I'll be very honest. I mean, uh, enabling our distributor, enabling our customer to completely think digital and come on board uh, with us has been very different. Uh, <coughs> Brand trust is about, you know, uh, some of the key metrics, what experience we offer than just the human being who's representing the brand in front of the customer. So what that has done is suddenly the distance between the prospect and the brand has suddenly been shortened, right? Because now uh, there is, it's not necessary, it, uh, the having an intermediary who goes and represents your brand to a consumer is not a mandate, right? Suddenly the consumer is wanting and willing to access, you know, uh, directly with your brand. And guess what? Uh, uh, 32% 30, of the traffic that comes on my platform today is actually searching for COVID. He's yeah. trying to find out if, if, if my policy covers COVID related deaths, right? I mean, uh, and, and, it's, it, and really it's a very engaging conversation that it becomes from there on. So, so really, uh, I'll tell you the big changes that we've seen in the last hundred days is a significant improvement in the user interface to start with, uh, which, which was, I think, significantly ignored in the category of BFSI. I know user experience comes, you know, something that is core to all of us, but I always believe that, you know, the first step to user experience is to create a decent user interface. Yes. So for, a, for a distributor enabling platform, you know, the kind of focus that we are putting on user interface, because remember now there is no human being training human being, right? Yes. Uh, there is a laptop or a, or a phone, mobile phone on which the training is happening between 50,000 odd agents and, you know, the central advertiser here. Yeah. A, a huge bank that is selling our products and we need to train uh, these folks on the new products, right? So, so that's been very interesting. The user experience has been core to us. Yeah. 
this system i agree dipali that's it's it's always been a case i think with anyone all vintage advertisers vintage manufacturers legacy system has always been a problem i'll tell you uh, frankly from a from a digital advertising perspective i think the advantage is that the digital advertising platforms are somewhat get agnostic to these legacy platforms you don't need to be smart enough to know what signal to send back right right solve the signal you solve the platform right mm. the way we try and look at it because you know all those legacy systems is something is is a is a long term process so really for us the focus has been from a digital acquisition perspective to solve the signal and not the platform great sir martin let me come to you you know you heard four different cmos uh, belonging to four different industries uh, one theme of digital transformation is running the same but how they execute in their companies is very very different and i want to underline what vibe have said that it's not just you know customer experience and the good design sensibilities but it's the sturdiness of the user interface uh, you know that also matters in times like these you know after listening to them i want to ask you therefore you know are the marketing services organizations in india or in the western world approaching this differently are they ready for the changing needs of the cmos that you heard today well i so dipali are you talking about the old or the new i'm talking <laughs> about the new i'm talking about the new to the young well, sir martin <laughs> well <laughs> well let's say the the old sir martin would be it would be you know the the, the ad holding companies are past their sell by day and and what's really interesting about your panelists you know Sundar Shalini Vivek Bhai Bhai they they're all actually interestingly uh, when you dissect it they're all indicating very similar things so, i mean one of the big things we've seen during the last 15 weeks is this shift now budgets as a whole i mean there've been two big buckets the tech companies by and large have kept their spending intact intact they might be shifting money from live sporting events where they had big commitments when the olympics were cancelled or postponed euro 2020 was postponed the ipl whatever money was shifted yeah. into purpose campaigns the sort of things that shalini talked about information campaigns many of them were not good because you know if you remove the logos or or the names you wouldn't know who was who was informing it was all the same stuff but putting that to one side the the intentions with the right intention it wasn't just virtue virtue signaling so i think what we're seeing and you see it uh sort of i it's iconic in the in the four experiences that we're hearing here is this shift to one to one communication personalization at scale dynamic creative which is what we're getting at i would say this wouldn't i I'm talking my own book with our holy trinity model of first party data you heard it mm. in spades here the importance of of you know with with which we haven't touched on google nixing third party cookies over 2 years apple taking it effectively out of your hardware right. the key and you know if you if you think about the insurance industry i was talking to somebody from the insurance industry only yesterday huge first party data yes how do you utilize that to build a relationship with yes. the consumer or the enterprise in addition most insurance companies work through a direct sales force or financial counselors you know warren buffett geico spends yes. about 1.2 billion to develop the geico brand at the consumer level and actually he evaluates the ceo in the annual his annual evaluation at margin before ad spend because he doesn't want the ceo to cut the spend yeah or whether it's traditional spend or online spend okay. so i think the first thing that you see you hear is this switch that's happened from the there has been budget cutting but traditional has lost out yeah. to to digital interestingly here in the uk i was talking you know, we we've just signed an loi with a really interesting company here in the uk and i was talking to the guy uh, who runs it and he was saying how television was so much cheaper here because of the lockdown the audiences have expanded the costs have gone down and yet you know, television is inflexible you have to make the commitments you have the upfronts in america it's a very rigid system online is much more flexible 
and has sucked money in. So that's one thing. Second thing is agility. I mean, you're hearing it in spades from the four panelists that moving at light speed is critically important. And, and, and sadly, human nature is such that when things are going well, you don't change. Yes. But when, when there's a burning platform, you get off your backsides, if I'm putting it, putting it crudely. Right. I think the third, third thing is the importance, I'll come back to the importance of data. This is absolutely critical. And most companies that we deal with, and the tech companies are different, by the way, because the tech companies tend to have built their companies in a very short period of time. They don't have analog systems. They don't, often they've grown organically rather than by acquisitions. They don't have different CIO and CTO systems. So data and pooling the data, I mean, we've seen an explosion during COVID, literal explosion yeah. in interest in data and analytics. And interestingly, it's not in the marketing budget. This is another important thing, which I'd like to hear what the panel thinks and what you think about this, Deepali. Yeah. There are three functions to me that have become important, not just the CMO function, but the CIO function. Yes. And, and the CSO function, the chief sales officer. So sales, marketing, and IT come together. Let me just give you one specific example. The banks, hmm. most of the major global banks spend about 10 to $11 billion a year on IT. That IT goes through the IT function, but a lot of it affects consumers yes. and is consumer-facing. Often the CMO yeah. doesn't have control of that spend. Yeah. Or any influence, forget about control, any influence. Yeah. So the CIO and the CTO goes in a direction yeah. and the CMO goes in another direction. It has to be unified. Yes. And I think those three things have it. So those, those are some things. And, and let me just, one other thing I think is really important in an Indian context. Facebook's move, you know, I would say in the insurance industry, yeah. the biggest threat to the insurers I mean, you've said it about yourself. You said about Google and Google search. It's Facebook. Mm. Facebook knows, has all the data. They have all the signals. They have the direct relationship with your ultimate consumer. Mm. You know, yeah, I, Ant Financial is just going public on the Hong, Hong Kong Stock Exchange you know, with this great froth in the Chinese market and Jack Ma and Alibaba and Daniel are taking advantage of that. Another example, the platforms have the information. Facebook's move with Geo is huge. It's huge. So. I agree. And let me answer since you asked me that direct question. I think what you said is music to, you know, uh, my ears and to companies such as IBM, because we are experts at, uh, you know, working with the CIO and the CMO and the CSO together. You know, IBM tends to bring them together. Mm -hmm. And one example that I want to give is State Bank of India in the country here, which is the largest bank and the numbers are mind boggling, uh, Sir Martin. We work with them. So their whole, you know, app, which is really sturdy. Uh, and has millions of downloads and millions of usage, you know, on a daily basis is has been built end to end by IBM, you know, so so I that's music to my ears what you say, because that's what the business, you know, IBM is in. And thank you for, you know, uh, summarizing and telling us, uh, you know, uh, what you're really talking about. And my second round of questions, you know, uh, to the CMOs that I have over here, and I want to go back to Vivek, you know, uh, so Vivek, you already spoke about the fact that digital transformation is happening. Um, and you know that it's accelerated. So what does the future look like? Very quick answers from the four CMOs before uh, you know we, we wrap up so very quickly first thing I would like to say is that digital transformation that we talk we often refer to digital advertising is not digital advertising alone yes. we as CMOs are not only responsible to take the message of the product or the service to consumers we also responsible for fulfillment so mm -hmm. give an example doctor fix it we don't only sell the product we we actually sell the whole waterproofing service to the consumer till then, which takes a few weeks. Yes. So we start with TV advertising, then a whole lot of digital advertising for lead generation and then fulfillment. So for digital transformation, I would say that CMOs are not only investing in digital advertising, they're also investing in the ecosystem around the whole fulfillment value chain, Yes. which could be the CRM system, which could be a SAP system, which could be linked to your employee data master, uh, which could be analytics and which is the call center and the state-of-the-art dialers. Yeah. 
since you asked me the question what is the future of digital transformation look like i would like to talk about four pillars of four things hmm. the first thing is continuing on the theme of that the digital transformation is beyond marketing the we are for example in pidlight are investing a lot in what is called iot manufacturing the digital factories as we call them right. or a supply chain transformation in terms of track and chase or procurement automation so this is one key aspect because when we digitally transform transform a supply chain and manufacturing will be truly digital company yeah the second big investment which will come will be in the area of analytics and not just enablement for example if when we actually automate a sales and field marketing we will we are going to be using and we using currently we are going to be increasingly using intelligent sales call data to make sure our productivity is more and we are able to sell the right thing to the right customer yeah for a b2b customer i think analytics can be and will be very wisely used for right pricing to our b2b customers yeah or to actually place the crm systems on top of a sap system and ensure that we have one customer view and we are able to get analytics data on on our b2b customers to ensure that the the sales process to the b2b customers customers is modernized and this is where as sir martin said the cmo connect with the chief sales and the sales uh, sales uh, part of the organization become very very strong right the third part which is about performance marketing and data and sir martin spoke about it but i want to really connect the three dots which he outlined for us which is data content and actually uh, uh, the programmatic yeah for example in fix it in the since you asked about the future we are going to be intensifying our effort effort in performance marketing to make sure that the lead generation is connected digitally through technology to the fulfillment process completely right and we are going to be using meta data far more through web scrapping to ensure that we we actually get far more useful and productive lead for example we can scrap the web data to know data around consumers loan when they are buying loans in the market for homes or the rera data which is there okay last but not the least in these times consumers are becoming very very health conscious and they are shying away from the direct physical contact therefore we are investing and we have to invest far more in direct to consumer channel d2c channels as we call them in this contest our investment in e-commerce strategies is becomes really really critical yeah. and in this contest it is not just about being present and selling it is all about the content generation it is about uh, tying up with vendors it is getting a supply chain ready to actually respond and supply yeah so if i would just like to mention two points here and on top of everything in the future about digital transformation i think i would like to first also talk about data since so much is being talked about and the whole thing about cookies i think players like us who are actually sitting on top of a lot of uh, what i call proprietary proprietary yeah. data on our customers and our contractors yeah. we have to be very very careful about sanctity of data when we use the performance marketing and data stacks yeah. and uh, the data protection norms have to be followed yes and secondly i think as marketers we have to really find marketing talent which is specialized and is knowledgeable to take our agenda forward we can't do everything ourselves and in this context in marketing services firms we have to increasingly find specialists it is not enough just to have one journalist agency in advertising or journalist in media or journalist in digital those days are gone yeah in digital also i need to have a social media specialist i need to have a ecom specialist i need to have a crm specialist i need to have a b2b specialist i need to have performance marketing specialist so i think the specialization of talent and tying up with the ecosystem are two critical aspect we must be mindful of when we do digital transformation in the future webber when i are smiling because you sound like a financial services cmo <laughs> performance marketing because we also sell services not just yeah. products yeah yeah exactly and you know but i must say that financial services have traveled this path perhaps a little sooner uh, than uh, you know the manufacturing companies vivek you know uh, so that is there and that's where you should look for talent from by the way yeah? you can hire from <laughs> you said well said you. Yeah. So, uh, Vaibhav and uh, Shalini and Sundar, I'm going to request you to be really quick because we have run out of time. But Vaibhav, I want you to talk about, apart from the things that Vivek said, what are some of the other concerns that CMOs need to be worried about? Again, Deepali, uh, I will try and be category specific because I've, I'm experiencing them firsthand right now, right? Instead of giving you a generic answer, uh, we, we've, as a life insurer, you know, transitioned from a face-to-face -face selling to what we saw as Uh, home to home selling right edge to edge or as i as uh, you know uh, some of our folks call it heart to heart selling right mm -hmm. uh, 
where the interaction is completely digital so uh, honestly the one uh, the couple of things that keep me awake in the night one the volume of data being generated and its uh, security right honestly that is something that is on my mind because you have uh, you know large this large scale distribution interacting with prospects uh, where i cannot uh, or my systems are not uh, completely embedded right in that we were not ready for these kind of businesses right right yeah. so so that's something that keeps me awake in the night in terms of security uh, the the other thing that keeps me really awake in the night is Uh, because there is the first level of underwriting right in 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 the insurance business right is all about smarter underwriting and the first degree of underwriting usually happens when a distributor meets a customer now with that uh, with the dilution of that meeting happening right and then looks like that's the way forward uh, my systems and my uh, ml and ai engines have to be extremely smart to identify any kind of frauds that can hit me right yeah. so that's where we are investing heavily right now for the last one month in trying to you know up the game on our existing algorithms to pick up these frauds on mortality or uh, you know in terms of uh, reinsurance the 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 big ticket item really for us is the big challenge i think that all life insurers are now facing i feel and you know when i talk to my peers is that suddenly you know the proposition has become as important as the relationship mm. we've been a category that has been for long driven by relationship selling uh, you knew mr sharma or you know for, for the sick i'm just giving a name who used to be your you know uh, good old friend of your father of you know some uncle who would come you would meet you would trust him and you would just go ahead and sign up an insurance policy with him i think i think that has transformed in these days because the consumer is not uh, you know in physical inter he always has access to this little mobile phone where he's always searching comparing as he is listening so the proposition has again come to the forefront uh, so i think all insurers are right now i see really working hard to up the game on the the product or the proposition or a service that we offer along with the relationship or the engagement so i think right. those are two three things that we are picking up but i think the good news is all of these are actually uh, oriented towards uh, making the customer win yeah so long term perspective actually this will turn out to be really really good but uh, you know let this be a lesson to the marketing fraternity who's listening in you know you hear vivek talk about iot we hear you talk about data security i think marketers need to up their game and learn about these things and of course come to ibm tell me on my twitter i will tell you all the stuff that you need to read okay <laughs> uh, shalini you know you you are i think in a complete enviable position as far as i'm concerned because when we come out of covid and we go back to the airports you know you are like the microcosm of a mall to me okay and uh, you and i spoke about it you know i mean i i'm ready to make my flight bookings i i think i will do the revenge flights that everybody is talking about revenge shopping okay uh, but i want you to really talk about how are you looking at managing this ecosystem that you have uh, inside the airport and vivek also referred to the ecosystem and i can tell you that with sbi you know we've seen that their success really lies because they've orchestrated the ecosystem really well inside their app you know and chalini i want you to highlight that and talk about that so uh, you know coming to the ecosystem the one word i'd use is collaboration because i think that's what we've seen uh, in the last two months particularly because you know at the risk of getting whiplash we all had to move over to a completely different way of flying so we've got a complete end to end contactless process something that not too many airports across the world have yet um and we've done that in collaboration with let's say cisf with all the airlines uh with the concessionaires on the ground because we've got a contactless payment uh contactless x contactless y so while contactless seems like a buzzword we actually had to literally roll it out in a span of about 3 weeks uh before flyers actually came back and the only way that was going to happen was uh, fnb concessionaires uh airlines cisf all others our own operations team everybody had to come together and so i've seen collaboration happen at a very different level in the industry and i include government yeah. uh, dgt i had to give permissions for certain old stamping etc to be taken away yeah. uh, because we had to move to contactless so this has literally been everybody in the ecosystem coming together uh to make this happen and all you were driving was reassurance and a safe customer experience because that's what at the end of the day is going to count mm-hmm. and the second one is something that sir martin referred to which is um the whole thing of the netflix model uh mm-hmm. the whole intimate communication whether you like it or not that is going to be the medium of tomorrow while we are doing contactless so for example we have the quad the paliano you've experienced it but we said at this time the quad is shut people are not going there so we experimented 
with taking a bunch of musicians and actually just you know doing something live yeah and i see a lot of brands doing that so i think we we're going to have to change our models yeah. uh and be very agile at at figuring out how we delivering that experience but probably through a completely digital medium so um i think i said this to you <laughs> we would have been considered a landlord at one point in time but it's really now we're a conductor of an orchestra how do you put everybody in together to yeah. deliver that kind of customer experience yeah, uh, in in an extremely collaborative fashion yeah um and yeah uh, you know when i used to be with mars the whole idea of a conductor of an orchestra was how we describe marketing and i'm actually seeing it come alive <laughs> on the ground pretty much so those would be the two big things that i think even marketers need to think about because no longer can we say it's me versus you or it's it's win win everybody's got to come together to deliver that's the only way the consumers going to come back up and buy again or fly again or anything yeah yeah so then my penultimate question to you before i ask sir martin one question and i'm requesting you to be brief so what should the brands do now what is your message to the brand since you speak to so many cmos what do you want to say to them um, yeah so you know i just want to go back and say these two things one is i think the topic of empathy we just coming across in everything that we spoke about yeah and empathy not just for your customers and um, it's also the employees number one uh, who are closest to you and you need to display that uh, the second thing is about your suppliers the point that you make sort of alluded to yeah. your people like your partners and people who are you know you are the community at large and of course your customers and yeah. they're very genuine in whatever we want to talk about and authentic in the way we want to communicate so that will be one second thing you know about prioritization uh, you know we are we are you know it's we got so many things to do and a lot of wild ideas that are coming if we just look at what each one of them chalani vivek and vibhav did actually was to prioritize what is important to them an answer to that probably the most important thing so for shalini it was information for about for vivek it was about a supply chain fiber it was about the query that was coming about corona virus whether it's been covered or not right so i think that is that's very very important and uh, i think i really like the point about adding fulfillment as an important part of that digitization because sometimes we might imagine or reimagine world in a very different way the imagine the world which is full of digital leaving out the very very important part of fulfillment out of it which i think is super super great, great. so thanks for those insights and thank you so much thank you and sir martin so the last question that i have from my side to you before we take on the audience question is that we i we heard from the cmos we heard from you and you know what my impression is that there is huge need for personal leadership in driving this transformation in accelerating mm-hmm. this transformation mm-hmm. what is the personal leadership trait that you think is going to be the most important one in time to come or just now okay so i i i want to thank all the panelists first for for vindicating our strategy <laughs> so, so so i i i go back to to the um, the battlefront uh reinvigorated if i uh, or even younger deeply Young. than i that i started this thing so that's one thing there there are two things i want to say firstly on these leadership traits the first is change agent uh and i i i say this out of self interest as well because we we operate most effectively where there are change agents inside the company where there is disruption for change and covid-19 sadly as i said before plays to that strength so one is change agents the second thing is you have to take back control i'm not saying you on this call but generally the marketing community lost control from about 2008 because it was low growth worldwide because there was very little inflation and still is very little pricing power there was fo- too much focus on cost and finance and procurement my view it became too powerful yeah and they cut because of zero based budgeting and emphasis on cost they cut the internal resources the demands today of first party data the netflix model that shalini referenced as well which i think is the best model and which mark pritchard at proctor the cmo at proctor 
Yeah. It's putting 1.2 billion consumer proof profiles, in-house content if necessary, and programmatic. So take back control. This is against agencies' interest. This is why, in part, the, the old agency model is outdated. If you think you can do this better in-house, do it. Mm. There are three models. In-house, embedded. That's where we put our people yes. in your premises. Yes. And then outsourced. If, if, if in a 24-7, always-on world, the, the, brief, the agency briefing process doesn't work. It doesn't work. You don't have three months to create a film. It's <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> awesome. so, so take back, this is, like, this is like the Brexit voter in the UK. Yes. The Brexit voter <laughs> wanted to take back control from Brussels. Yes. Take back control. Okay. I think it's a wonderful <laughs> message. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I do think, and I like that idea of taking back control. And I, I also believe totally in that message. Again, I want to sum up before we take on one or two questions that we have from the audience. Uh, you know, I want to sum up and say, I think the importance of data got spoken about, the importance of, you know, data security got spoken about, importance of analytics got spoken about. And what Sir Martin said about, you know, the new model of the marketing services organizations emerging. And I really like what he said, take control. And one of the important things about taking control I my message to the marketers always is learn more and this is the time to learn more about technology technology solutions technology solution providers you know we at IBM for example <clears throat> are talking about the integration of design and technology together and that's going to change the space also and you know we have this whole we have 16,000 people by the way that we employ across the world in our customer experience design team uh, you know, who service, uh, by the way, marketers and the customer experience, uh, you know, interested CIOs. So with that message, you know, I'm going to take on uh, two questions. One of the questions that's been asked, uh, and uh, Sir Martin, of course, since you're with us, I'm going to request you to answer that and delight our audience. Uh, there's Sri Ranga who said that what is the right skill sets for the CMO in the post-COVID era? I know you said take control, uh, but I think for the younger guys who are wanting to become CMOs, what are the three qualities, I would ask his question to you, that you think are extremely important for being a CMO? Um. Well, we've heard, I think, firstly, having an understanding. Well, let me sort of back up for a minute. You've heard from four people on the panel, well, five people, including Dipali, our, 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 chair, our chairperson. You've heard tremendous wisdom and insight. And... Let me be very, very direct. When I see companies spend one month, two months, three months, four months, five months, on, five, when, when I see companies go into a review process for three, four, or five months, I, I think it's, I, I'm going to be very direct, I think it's insane. Yeah. yeah. The world is moving at light speed. We've just heard great intelligence from the five of you. You know more about marketing in your industries than any agency probably will ever know. You know the people who can deliver what you need, whether it's in-house, embedded, outsourced. So the first thing is speed of action, right? Agility. I come back to that. That and and COVID nineteen just ratchets it up even more. And when we come out of COVID-19, all your competition, as you well know, are going to be pushing in the same direction. So I would say, you said three things. Agility is one. Um, I think Shalini said, talked about the orchestra. I think that's critical too. I think understanding the interrelationship within an organization. I mean, I, the difference between S4 and WPP is we're fully integrated. You know, Srini, who I dearly love, and we're all sad about Srini's mum, and we all, you know, wish him long life and uh, wish his family long life. But, you know, Srini is the country manager in India. He has to orchestrate, which is very difficult to do, because you have, you know, good people are difficult. In fact, the better people are in the agency business, 
the more difficult they are to work work with. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and good people are difficult, which is a bad thing to say because that means good people will, average people will be difficult because they think by doing so they'll be good. So I would say integration of functions. We talked about sales, we talked about marketing, we talked about IT. And then I think, uh, I think I would say persistence. You know, I, I, I'm really keen on persistence because organizations tend to be highly political. Mm. Um, and I, I think as a result of that, you have to be very persistent. So agility, integration, persistence, and then maybe I shouldn't say this. The other thing is I'd add a fourth, learn code <laughs> and, and, and learn Chinese. Okay. That, those, are, those are five very interesting messages. <laughs> and I think there's a sixth one, you know, which is, uh, Martin, for you, you're going back younger. So it's about the company that you keep. So keep company with us. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let me wrap up with that. I think we can continue this conversation on Twitter. Uh, there are very, very interesting insights that happen. And I'm really grateful to Vivek, Shalini, Sundar and Vaibhav for bringing in their insights. Anurag, thanks for giving all of us the opportunity by bringing Sir Martin here. And Sir Martin, really, really pleasure talking to you and your insights that you're sharing. Years of wisdom, you know, brought home to us. Uh, I don't know about that, Dipali. You should be in the advertising business on the basis of what you just said. But one thing I should say, I'm delighted to continue the debate with anybody and everybody on the call, particularly the, 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 the five of you, um, at, at Martin, Martin at S4Capital.com. So yes. anybody wants to uh, continue the, de the debate, let's do it. Thank yeah. you very much. And thank you, Dipali, for chairing it. Thank you, Biba, Biba. Thank you, thank, Sundar, you. thank you, Selini. Thank you, Vivit. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you very much. And thank you, Anurag. Thank you, Anurag. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, team. It's yours now. Tell me what to do. I'm done. Thank you, guys, for listening in. <laughs> uh, and let's continue the conversation with Sir Martin and on our Twitter handles. Uh, all of us are there. Thank Navel you. and Anurag, over to you. Thank you, Dipali. Since we're discussing Thank digital you know. uh, transformation, one of the you know interesting and important things that Sundar said, you know, which I also read in uh, last year, I remember in an HPR article about digital transformation. As we all know, digital transformation is not about you know digital marketing. It's not about only implementing digital into your processes. It is also about so much about you know human beings. And I think one of the key aspects of digital transfer transformation for organizations today is to take away the human anxiety element because a lot of people across sectors are, you know, very worried about their jobs, about upskilling, reskilling and things like those. So I think one of the aspects that uh, get kind of, you know, undervalued and missed while we talk about digital trans transformation is the human aspect. And as Sundar said, we are all moving towards a digital economy. But COVID has at least kind of taken us back to our human roots where, uh, you know, we are more empathetic to each other, where we are asking each other first about our health before we talk about business. So I think that's a fantastic thing. I hope we all remember to uh, stay like this once uh, COVID is behind us. Thank you, Sir Martin, for joining us. Thank you, Dipali Sundar, for having championed this entire conversation and having made this happen. And before I go, I think just to sum up, three, four things that Sir Martin said, which have been spoken about uh, quite a bit over the last uh, few months and uh, years. Uh, data, content, programmatic, these are going to drive the shapes of businesses. And as we can see, the old definition of, you know, which are the companies that uh, will have uh, digital leadership has significantly changed. Today, you have a Netflix coming from nowhere. Google has grown, become a media tech. You know, we have this term, term I mean, there were technology companies, then came marketing technology. Now there's media tech and everybody is encroaching into the other company's domain. You have companies like tech, uh, Tesla, which are kind of changing the technology and the auto space. So digital transformation really is going to uh, drive our lives and the shape of digital transformation will change. With, thank, with that, thank you uh, everyone for joining us. Thank you to all the panelists again. Till next time, stay safe and we'll look forward to seeing you soon again. Take care. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye, Thank everybody. You so Take care. Thank you.